And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to, coming to us all the way from the land of heavens and heresies, because we love alliteration here in, our, in the holy grounds. The one and only Tanner Walker. No, he's not a no, he's not a ranger. Though rangers are playable in this game. How you doing? How you doing tonight, man? I'm doing all right. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for thanks for coming on and braving the hell of t of time zones because space <laughs> is warped and time is bendable. Ah, uh, time means nothing in a pandemic. You know, every just, everything's just online now, right? That's what I'd like to say, but <laughs> but I still have to man I still have to manage time zones he here, so it's still pain. Yeah, yeah. But a tr a um one of the big traditions around here, obviously, is the humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you to walk walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Uh, yeah, so uh, the first time I got introduced to role-playing games was, was right about the time 3.5 had just come out. Uh, I think it was like 12 years old, and there was an ad in the newspaper, it's, it's quite a while ago, uh, for a local like kind of YMCA-funded program that round, uh, kind of ran a you know Dungeons & Dragons game from a local game shop. And so me and my buddies had you know signed up for that and i think it was a total of like seven sessions that you ran um and so we all you know made characters i think it was from like levels one to three so you know one to three and 3.5 is not a whole lot of power but you know when you're a kid um seems like a whole lot and so that was my kind of first introduction to playing we all kind of played i played a uh, a sorcerer at first um, and since we were all kind of friends, we all kind of worked together, and I remember the, the thing that made it stick for me was we were in a dungeon, I think we were level two, and it was an ogre and a bunch of, I think, hobgoblins were in there, and we started missing over and over and over, and they started hitting over and over and over again as the rounds went down, and our fighter went down, and then, right as our fighter went down, our rogue decides to run because he doesn't want his character to die. And then another one of our party members, who I think was a monk, went down. And so then the rogue's running away during this entire time, and I'm out of spell slots as a sorcerer. You know, I'm a level 2 sorcerer in 3.5, which is, you know, about as low as you can go. Mm. And so I'm like, alright. And so, you know, I throw the spear at the, uh, the ogre managed to crit and then confirm the crit because you know we had to do that um drop it and then get just like torn apart by hobgoblins and then the hobgoblins go up and uh you know finish off our rogue who is running um but that for me made the game like kind of the most fun i'd ever had because there were stakes to it right you can make mistakes and then you know you suffer the consequences and of course when we remade characters right we made them with that kind of encounter in the back of our minds but it wasn't so much the characters that we had remade, it was like, okay, well now we know how to work together, we know who to put up front, we know who to hold back, we know kind of how to play the game in a tactical way that led to cooperation. Which, for me, was, you know, way more fun than, even more fun than I had, you know, originally been having. So, after that, you know, we still all wanted to play Dungeons & Dragons, but, you know, the kind of little program was over, so... Um, you know, all I was, you know, the smaller person in my group, you know, um, and it wasn't that I was a small guy, um, but my friends are, like, huge, like, you know, growing full facial hair in junior high huge. Um, so, like, okay, well, you're going to be the GM or the DM. And it's like, okay, so I remember I would, uh, I bought, I didn't have any of the books. Uh, I was kind of poor growing up, so I didn't have any of the books. So I would go to their house and I would borrow the books, um, walk them over to my house because they only let me have them for a few hours at a time, and I would copy down everything I th thought I needed to know from the books into like this little legal pad I had and then 
I would prepare the games from my notes in the legal pad, and we'd run games that way. And, you know, if your 13-year-old kid went running D&D off of notes from your legal pads, it's generally a shit show, but it was fun, right? And that's how I kind of got into game design and tinkering and kind of making mechanics. Is like, well, I don't really have all the mechanics in front of me, so I need to improvise, and I need to figure out what the mechanics should be based on the notes I've already taken. So that was kind of my introduction to... Uh, to D&D and kind of game design. It's kind of just grown from there. Now, it's interesting that you that you go that you went that you went with um 3rd edition as your intro. When now some designers um largely stick with one rule system um th- throughout and some and some will go all over the place over the years. Were did you largely stick with the D20 for for most of that time? So, I've always been kind of a research-oriented person, and so, and I didn't know that there were other systems until a little bit later, right? But once I learned that there were other systems other than Dungeons and Dragons, you know, my idea was to run through them, um, and look through them and read through them. Of course, that's different than playing, right? But, you know, you kind of work with what you got. Uh, And for running games, ever, you know, I'd run D&D when I was... You know, younger, but then ever since then, you know, D and D is hard to get people who don't really, especially D and D three point five or even like Pathfinder. Mm-hmm. If someone's like not in the know, it's relatively hard to kind of get them in, right? Without truncating the whole, rules whole bit or not telling them everything because there's just too much to teach them. So for the most part, I was like, okay, well, how can I present this in a way where I can get people to actually play with me? Um, you know, in these different games, uh, so. It wasn't that so much that I was like married to the D twenty system, um, but you know, I played through a couple of other ones. I read through other ones, um, but that's the one that has like the, the you know the special place in my heart. So that's why I kind of when I des- when I'm designing this one at least, uh, that's you know what I'm using as a basis. Well, let's get let's get into that. So, mm-hmm. how did? the kernel of the idea of he- of heavens and heresies come about so um this was you know a few years back i wanted to you know i moved to the um area for my grad school and i wanted to play D D again because i hadn't played in a while um so we looked up the local game shop near us and i started going to the public games i started first as a player and it was kind of my first introduction to fifth edition I was like, okay. And so I approached it with the same mentality. I kind of approach everything as like, I want to know everything about this game and how to play it and what all the classes do and this, that, and the other. So, you know, I started researching for that and I quickly came to realize that that makes life hard for a DM. And that was never my intention. Hmm. But when you have a player, um, because my goal always, whenever I play or GM, is I want to make people have fun. Right, and I want to work with people to help them have fun if they're not having fun. Mm-hmm. And so, when you're in a large group, especially in like a local setting, um, and you know your ranger is kind of down because he's like, "Wow, um, next round they're just going to murk me with all the spells they have." And so you say, "Hey, you're a ranger. Do you have silence prepared?" He's like, "Okay, yeah, I do." Okay, well, why don't you cast silence on that group? Because I'm betting most of their spells have you know verbal components. And they'll actually have to move out of the your spe- or silence area, even if they can, which they probably can't because they're tied up with our fighter. And then you won't get blasted to oblivion. And they're like, "Oh, yeah, thanks, man." And so that makes them fun. But for the you know the DM who's running, he's like, "Crap, no, this make now I have to instead of just enjoying my you know kind of leisurely game, I have to think about it in this very hyper tactical way, and that's not fun for me." And so I kind of in trying to help the players have fun, I kind of made the life harder for, you know, this newer GM who did a fantastic job, in my opinion, but it was still, like, it wasn't what he wanted to run, right? Because he couldn't relax, and that was my fault. And so, from being a player, I quickly switched into uh, being a a DM. Like, okay, um, I don't want to put anyone through that, I will kind of run all that, and I can kind of have my cake and eat it too that way. Mm -hmm. And so I started DMing for, you know, a public group, which is kind of a trial of, you know, by fire in and of itself. And, you know, these groups are about 10 people, which is way too much for 5e to really handle with their, you know, the way they kind of do challenge ratings or encounters. And so it was mostly me figuring out how to make this game fun for 10 people. 
And mm -hmm. because of that, and the kind of work I put into it, I started seeing things that I really liked about 5th edition. There were certain things that I thought were really good and made for a very fun play experience. And there were other things that were like, this makes, this makes my life a lot harder. There's a lot of things I need to require, or I'm required to do in order to make this game fun for them that I don't think I should have to do. And so that's where the kernel began. It's like, okay, well, what would I do differently? And so I started to, for my home games, I started to, you know, make, you know, the list of homebrew rules and like, okay, well, these homebrew rules are like a band-aid because I'm still not running the game that I really want to run. And so I started thinking, okay, well, you know, I've tinkered with games for a while. What would that system look like? What is the system I want to run? Why, you know, why do I enjoy these things that I enjoy? How can I make a system that emulates that? And... You know, how do I communicate that to other people? And that's where the kernel began, is from those kind of public, you know, local game shop games for 5th edition. And, you know, seeing certain things that I liked, seeing certain things that I didn't like. Yeah, and I, I can... S now, one of, the things that I, one of the things that I noticed when I went, when I went through the, um, the, do the document that, we, that mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. is... And it is an emphasis on, um, on gr on the group experience to the point where you put it where in the introduction, you put an entire chapter called a defense of tactical play. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I have my, I have my guesses as to what could as to what could spur something like that on, but I'd mm -hmm. like to he I'd like to hear your your take as far as why. Yeah. So it's funny enough that chapter was still when I was running fifth edition. Right, because I had even when I was a player or when I was a DM, both times, people would ask me, "Why are you so like tactically minded?" Right, and for me, it was like because I'm trying to role play a character that wants to survive. Right, when I when I look at tactics, I'm not trying to meta game. I'm trying to be in the narrative. I'm trying to look at it from the perspective of someone who doesn't want to die. And here are the tools they have available to them. And how are they going to use these tools to survive? That's kind of what I'm looking at. And I, after explaining that kind of over and over and over again to people, I'm like, okay, I'm going to write all this down. And I'm going to you know, have that written. So when people ask me, I can kind of you know, reference it or at least like give them a summary of it. So at least I have my thoughts down. But for me, it was, all right, if I'm a fighter, right, and I want to live, how do I do that? Well... I can't do it by myself. I've got a limited arsenal, right? The mechanics of the game are my representation of the kind of world's reality. And there's only so much I can do within that reality. Okay, well, if I really want to survive, what does that look like? Well, it means I need to rely on my wizard to control certain elements of a, an encounter that I can't control. Right? I need to put my trust in him. Because if I don't, if he doesn't understand what my trust entails, then we're not going to perform as well, and I might die. And I don't want to die. And so for me, what led to that kind of segment, um, that chapter, was I wanted to show people, or at least some people, that there wasn't a huge discrepancy between role-playing and the mechanics of the game. Uh, at least in theory, they should go hand-in-hand. -hand. Now, I understand that you know a lot of people's groups, they're kind of viewed as like polar opposites. Um, but I wanted to present it to people in such a way where they shouldn't be polar opposites. They should both help each other. One shouldn't get in the way of the other. Both should kind of build off the other and create a kind of more fun experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to now, something something that I do find interesting about that about that question that you asked the whole why, mm -hmm. why are you why are you thinking about this through tactics? I mm -hmm. um. My theory, my theory, as far as as far as why that question would be brought about, and maybe this is something that you saw with your own experiences, is that you have—I don't want to say a generation because I don't think this is a generational thing—but mm -hmm. you do have a seg a segment of of role players who are hyper focused on the idea of story. Not, mm -hmm. sto not story in terms of in terms of storytelling, but the idea of what it, of a story based game, mm -hmm. and the idea the idea of and um the idea of thinking tactically is treated as a dirty word because in part because of the fallout from from um, people misunderstanding what fourth edition was trying to do. Yeah, <laughs> no, I agree with you there. And, 
but um, but the idea that if that if you're trying to think tactically, you're not looking at this as a as a inter as a collaborative story. You're looking at it as a board game. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, you're tr you're trying to meta game or power game, which, whichever um, whichever term you want to use. And yeah, um, my 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 approach has has always been if if that's truly if that's truly the case that it's more about, that's more about the story then why are you playing a game with defined classes and why are you and why is it that whenever i whenever i run um games with my with my lgs when i would mm -hmm. do, when i would do one shots with them there would always be people talking about okay who okay who's going to be the tank or or who's going to be the healer mm -hmm. that kind of thing um mm -hmm. For as for as free form as people want as people want to claim, eventually they're going to fall into certain archetypes. Um, yeah. Shadowrun is not a class is, is not a class based game, but in practice it may as well be. <laughs> exactly. Just yes. to just to illustrate my point. Mm -hmm. um, was 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 that was there that kind of um, when when people would bring up the whole tactical thing? Was there that kind of assumption? So, the way I kind of compose myself when I'm going in, uh, when I'm playing kind of cooperative games, I'm never trying to, I'm never trying to ruin anybody's fun, and I always try to make sure people know that. And I always, you know, will kind of take the fall if need be. So when most people were asking me, you know, why are you kind of approaching this from tactical? I mean, there's was, there, there was always dicks in the world who were trying to just, you know, I don't know, put the screws in you or whatever. But for the most part, they're like, okay. Why are you put? What they wanted to know is why are you putting so much energy, right? That was the question a lot of people were asking. Why are you putting so much into this? And for the people that weren't, for the people who didn't say anything but were you know part of the conversation, part of the table, I also wanted to you know let them know, hey, I'm not trying to. I'm trying to have fun the same way that you're trying to have fun, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be a character in a story, right? And from my view personally, this is how I be a character in a story. It's by trying to survive because that's what the story is about. Is trying to get through this so i always try it like because most of the time right when people think that tactics are bad or they think that strategy is bad they've had a bad experience with it right they've had a person who's ruined their game from saying no you can't do this no you can't do this and has tried to put tried to reduce their agency in the game um through what they find fun and i always try to like push back against that I'm like no why but we can have both right we're cooperating with each other we're playing a cooperative game we should be friends here and Try to help each other have fun. Um, but, but yeah. Hmm. And because of be, I'd say I'd say I'd say be, I'd say the whole putting it the the wording of that of that question the whole why are you putting energy mm -hmm. to this? Um, I think I think ultimately de demonstrates. A bit, a bit of an, a bit of a issue with, with some, ha with some, um, t with some, t with some, having this idea that there is a way that you're supposed to do things, and, mm -hmm. but, getting, getting to the nitty gritty of things, um, yeah, because the the other aspect that was in that defense of ta of tactical play that I wanted to go and do is the what you called the myth of self sufficiency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What spur? What's what's the what were the kind of experiences that spurred on something like that? Is it more? Is it, was it a reaction to to your play experiences or something else? Um, it was it was from my play experiences, right? Because you know I had been running games for a, for a while, and when I went to this local game shop and was finally a player, what I noticed was this weird trend that I had never noticed before, right? Because when you're playing with friends mm -hmm. right you're you have a very different experience but that's not how role-playing games are played for a lot of people right a lot of times they're playing at their local game shops they're playing online with people they don't really know and i think because of that there is this kind of trend of play that i think is very destructive and it's this trend of selfish play where people say you have to make your own fun in this game, and that's your responsibility for you to do. And I, I just agree with that. I don't think that's what cooperative games should be about. For me, cooperative games are about helping everyone around you have fun, because if everyone's doing that, you have, depending on how many people are in your group, like, you know, 
four, five, six people in your group all wanting to help you have fun, and you're doing the same. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're only trying to make your own fun, you are competing for fun. And that's not cooperative. That's the opposite of cooperative. You're competing to have your own fun at the cost of everyone else's fun. And so when I talk about the myth of self-sufficiency in that piece, um, what I'm trying to do is show people that, hey, if you are only out for yourself, right, and whether that is like kind of on a narrative level, whether that's on a just even a tactical level, you're going to lose, right? If you're trying to, and so on a narrative level, if you're trying to compete against eight other people for the DM spotlight, you're either going to have to be obnoxious and no one's going to like you, or you're going to have to kind of finagle your way with the GM and no one's going to like you. There's no winning in that situation. You have seven other people at the group. You know, if it's an eight, nine people group, you have like seven other people in the group who just don't like you. That's not a good way to play it. And on a tactical level, right? If you're only saying, I only, I only, the only thing that matters is me surviving, well, your group's going to die, right? Because this game requires you to rely on your teammates. You have to rely on your teammates. The kind of core component to a lot of these role playing games is that you have people that fill different niches. And if you try to fill all of the niches, you're going to be kind of underpowered in a lot of respects, and it's just not going to be as fun of experience. So for me, the myth of self-sufficiency is the idea that you can do everything just as good as, you know, a gr giant group, and that's just not true. And I've, uh, that, So that section was really to show people that, right? That, hey, as a group, you're a lot, more, you're a lot stronger, right? When you rely, when you trust, when you kind of do actual cooperation, not only does the game get more fun on a narrative level, on a tactical level, the game explodes in options and is a much more fun, but also like rewarding experience, right? Mm -hmm. When you can rely on something and knowing that they're going to rely on you, those bonds you create, even if it's just on that superficial tactical level, are going to strengthen your role playing, right? When you can say, hey, you know, this fighter was in the front line, um, you know, defending my life as I was downed. And then, you know, this person, you know, gave me a potion, got me back up. And I was able to protect the fighter from this group that was coming in. That makes for a really good narrative moment. And that's all tactical right there, right? That's all tactical positioning. But if you are then in the tavern talking about that on a narrative level, the fighter just saved your life and you just saved his. That should create a really strong bond on the narrative. So, that's what I'm trying to show people with that, right? That there's this myth that you can create your own fun. You can't. This is a group game, right? If you want to create your own fun, you should be playing a single player game, but you're not. And it's not like there's a sh it's not like there's a shortage of um, of RPGs dedicated just to solo play. And I'm not using this to make a video game analogy. Um some somebody who's been somebody who's been kind of, who's been kind of a pioneer of that kind of thing lately is mm -hmm. um friend of the show Jake Jacob DC Ross. Mm -hmm. Who's been doing? A, who's been pushing a lot, pushing a lot of that kind of stuff. Plus, there's mm -hmm. been, plus the whole game book thing has been around for years. So, mm -hmm. there, but um, I and remember. Mention, oh, sorry. I remember my mentor once saying that the worst, the ab, the absolute worst kind of character that anybody can try and try and bring to the table is the is the lone wolf kind of character. Um, exactly. Yeah. Or in the furthest extreme of that, it was something that was on the old um, RPG.net article called the Nenad, Neutral Evil Ninja Assassin Drow. <laughs> I think I've read that, actually. It was ringing bells. Which was basically designed as, as a general, don't fucking do this. Yeah. Ah, uh, in the same in the same way, Mar in the same way, the Mary Sue was was written as a don't do this for fan fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Now, some now um, when it obviously you're you obviously um, when I looked at the the framework that you have for Heavens and Heresies, mm -hmm. it's very clear that um, I'd say D D and D is a is a major framework, and I'd say Fifth Edition D and D is it is more specific in that framework. But what would be some of the major changes that some that somebody would have would um would have to not this, I don't want to say adapt to because that f that feels like they're it feels like it's you're forcing somebody to do it like yeah, yeah. no I got gotcha. to catch right-handed 
but what are some of the major changes that they'd have to that they'd have to be aware of jumping jumping from 5e into your system from one burning ship to another no i got gotcha. you <laughs> no uh so there are a couple like i said uh before there are a couple things i really liked about fifth edition right they they almost gave me that nostalgia feel when i had played 3.5 and there were a couple things i really didn't like one thing i didn't like is that a lot of the characters felt like they were being built as individuals right they had they were all trying to present themselves as self-sufficient and what i also didn't like and this came from my experience as a player is that if you started working together it made the game unfun for your poor dm right if you started really like working together on the highest level um it made the game really hard for your dm to make just a fun game for you and i didn't like that and so so for one of the key differences right in this system a lot of the characters are meant to be weak in areas. You build yourself to kind of be what you want, but the jack-of-all-trades is very rarely something that's available to you. And the jack-of-all-trades is an option, and it provides, you know, kind of fills a specific niche, but there are still, if you build one, there are other niches that will need to be filled in other ways, right? So, should I talk mechanics, or should I talk more generally? Uh this is we'll, ca we'll cast a wide net and then we'll ca and then we'll um, narrow it. Okay. So, uh, first thing, right? I wanted the emphasis on so for mechanics for abilities that people had. I wanted them in some way to promote working together. So each class has something that helps the party, right? Mm -hmm. Because helping the party should be helping yourself, right? If you're helping the party, you're also helping yourself. So the mechanics kind of support that. Um, each class is not so much a specific role in you know the classical tank which i don't think exists but believe well we can go to that later um but you know or damage dealer or whatever so each class doesn't really have a specific role that they fill in that sense they're more of a play style right they're very open and you can build them to kind of be in the role that you want to be in and on that level um the way i hand it, handle um ancestries or races um is very different than 5th edition. Um, because the other thing I want is I want to reward people mechanically for the cool ideas that they have. And I don't. And there are certain aspects of 5th edition D&D that I don't think do that. There are some race and class combinations that are kind of mechanically better than others. And I didn't want to build a game that did that. I want, I want a dwarven wizard to be kind of equal in power levels than El or as compared to an elven wizard, but I want them to be mechanically different, hmm. right? So I developed my ancestries, right, to have more, to be different, very different from one another, and to pair almost like multi-classing very well with any of the uh, any of the classes. So that's a core difference. The other way is the skill. I mean, there, it's difficult. It's actually a lot easier to talk about similarities than it is about differences, but. Um, the way combat, or I shouldn't say combat because I don't actually run combat, I run encounters, but the way counters are tracked in terms of initiative runs completely different. The way your ability scores, even though I do use the term ability scores, the way they kind of affect you is different. The way skills work is re is different. The way your defenses, I did, I did like the defenses in 5th edition. I just, I did what they sh I thought they should have done. Which was, you know, um, you get rid of AC and just use the defenses. So I, I oh, sorry, um, saves. I liked that they had to save for each one. I don't like the concept of saving. I think if you're attacking, you roll the dice um, against someone's defense. So I just kind of flipped them and converted all your saves to a static number called defense. And um, in the, I'm so, guessing in the process, you get you want you wanted to get rid of the whole some certain effects that have auto hit attitudes. I it depends. I like auto hit things, right? What I don't like is saver suck spells. I don't like that you can waste resources to get nothing. I always want when people spend resources to at least get something. Mm -hmm. Um, auto hit is not so much of an issue for me. In fact, in in the mechanics of the uh, nitty gritty mechanics, when you make an attack with a weapon, a weapon attack, you are guaranteed half damage. Even if you miss. You don't get any of the riders on that attack, but you are guaranteed half damage. Mm -hmm. 
Um, because from in the system, um, your hit points are not your health, and I'm clear on that. In my you know description of the your hit points are the means you use to defend yourself, and when you run out of them, you don't have any other means to defend yourself, and that's when you get hit. Um, more kind of like Odin. Mm -hmm. So, <sighs> sorry, I lost my train of thought there. You gotta you gotta remind me where I was. <laughs> um, you were. You were, you were on um, you were on the whole auto hit because we were discussing oh, yeah. um, some where where things are going to get different, and you had mentioned that you don't care for um, save or die, and I will admit that whenever I think of that, I think of um, all the all the nightmares when it comes to certain encounters, especially the king of bullshit that is the beholder. <laughs> exactly as the beholder. Yeah. So like my. My problem with the Saver Suck spells, or the Saver Die spells, mm -hmm. is there's a couple of issues. One, on the player's side, you are... it's a For me, it's a it's like a mathematical formula for fun. And for me, Saver Die spells, no matter how they resolve, they always lead to people not having fun. Because, you know, let's go to the Beholder, right? Mm -hmm. Or you know, let's go to the player side. It's easier from the player side. So if a player has a you know save or die spell and they use it on the enemy, right? And they use that one spell and then the enemy fails, the encounter is over, pretty much, right? It might you know take a while and drag out, but because the spell is so powerful, because it does nothing if it fails, the encounter is not fun anymore. You've effectively neutralized the encounter and with one spell, and now it's kind of pitters on for a little bit, and you're not having fun anymore, because it's not engaging, it's not dynamic, it's just, well, it's kind of over, let's play these next seven rounds out, and kind of end it, but it's over. So that's one, on one hand. On the other hand, you use your save or die spell, and nothing happens. And it's like, wow, I just wasted my turn, and nothing happened. And you're still not having fun, because you just wasted a bunch of resources um, on nothing. And so... A lot of people say, well, you know, it will, um, the amount of times it will succeed will balance out with the amount of times it will fail. And my point is, well, even if it succeeds, you're not having fun. And if it fails, you're also not having fun, right? Like, it doesn't balance out. In both cases, no one's having fun. And for me, that was the problem with those save or die spells. It's, I, I can, I can definitely see a, for me, um, I'd always, arg I'd already, as I'd always argued that, um, that there's two problems with that kind of thing. One, um, you are pl you are placing you are placing faith you are placing faith and prayers in R N Jesus. Yeah, and yeah, but, yeah. as you as you're probably aware, one of the mantras we have here in the temple is that the dice gods are merciless. <laughs> uh, for me, only when I'm at a GM, and then I can't roll above a five. But yeah, yeah, no, I get you. <laughs> and two, and two. The, the you are um the diff the the diff the difficulty in those in those sort of things does not does not have does not present a narr does not present a narrative or a gameplay flow I guess is, I guess is the better word that I can put it it's more it's more of a de it's more of a dead stop um you know I hadn't really thought about it in that terms but I definitely agree with you there that that's another problem with it is that it doesn't yeah. It doesn't create anything. You're right in yeah. that. Are Are you familiar with the concept of flow theory? Um, not off the top of my head, but I'm also terrible with titles. So as you explain it to me, I might remember. Um, now this is something that I've seen. This is something that I've seen um extrapolated on when it comes to video game design. But I do think it applies just as well to tabletop, especially mm -hmm. given the important balance that you have to apply as the GM. Mm -hmm. um, now. In video game design, it's u it's used to represent difficulty o difficulty over time. Think of mm -hmm. it as think of it as a um as an x y axis graph, where gotcha. ac one one axis is difficulty, the other axis is um t is time. Mm -hmm. Um, and you want it you want it to go as close to a di as close to a straight diagonal line as you can. If you end up in, if you end up increasing the difficulty too quickly, then you create frustration. If you end up increasing it too slowly, then you create boredom. Mm hmm Okay. And from from when it comes to how this applies with um, tabletop design, 
and the, and why I use this, why I think it's a bad um bad 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 instance when those save or die things are being used with them. With within within this whole flow concept is mm -hmm. the idea that every action that you're that you're doing should in one form or another move th move things further than what they were mm -hmm. i in the same vein I'm a, I'm a big proponent of fail forward which is kind of going with this idea the the idea that even if you fail that shouldn't mean that shouldn't mean a stop to the pace mm -hmm. okay um and with sit with save or die you either you either you either succeed or you or you or you or you mm -hmm. end up having to stop the the flow I hear what you're saying there. Um, actually, that creates a good segue to uh, one of the things I want to mention. Mm -hmm. Is that for difficulty was always something I wanted to address with this game, right? Mm -hmm. Because I I liked. I, it's always a part of RPGs that you get more powerful. You start to feel more powerful, right? That's a big one of them. You start off as kind of this weak, measly little thing, and you get bigger, better, whatever. Now, for me, what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of toy with that a little bit with this system so in terms of the game when you start off um you get a lot more at, if we're comparing it to fifth edition right mm -hmm. you get a lot more at level one in this game than you do at, in fifth edition because for me the difficulty of each encounter almost remains constant but what doesn't remain constant is so like each encounter is kind of equally difficult but for very different reasons as the game progresses so as you get higher level, you're able to do a lot more with, you know, the resources that you have. And, you know, to kind of compensate for that, the encounters get a lot harder. So as you progress in level, it's not so much that the game gets harder, but it does get more complex. Mm -hmm. The difficulty level stays about, you know, the same. I don't want it to be too difficult for people. I don't want it to be too easy for people. I want it to hit that, like, nice little middle point. So difficulty actually stays the same. It's the complexity that goes up as, you know, time... Um, goes on because you have more options available to you to solve a situation and thus the uh, the difficulties that oppress you you know also become more numerous as well mm -hmm. <laughs> but um with, with the failing forward thing um I, li I like that you mentioned that because I think what you touch on there a little bit um, and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this is there especially in RPGs right and I've, I've said um, previously that one of the things I like about RPGs is that there are consequences to the choices that you make, permanent ones. Right? Um, a, you know, a lot of time, especially if you're low level, you die, you die. You know, you bring bring in your next character. Right? And I like that. Uh, that for me, I agree, and I understand that not everyone does, but for me, I really like that. I like to know that my choices that I make have meaning and they have weight behind them. But I also, you know, just from a design perspective, I totally understand that it sucks to have your character die, right? To not have, you know, this character you put all this time in, you've worked in, it, like, it sucks to have that thing you've put so much effort into just be like, boop, oops, bad roll of the dice, now your character's dead. So, one thing um, that I've kind of developed in the system is it's right now because you know all my titles are work in progress but it's called the death flag right mm -hmm. so in the, in the mechanics of this game if at least one person in your group survives an encounter every everyone's assumed to have survived right um that's just how the mechanics work you know if one, at least one person gets through you guys did it you're all you're all alive but the encounters um, are supposed to be very difficult. And so there is a mechanic called the death flag. Now, only a player can choose to raise the death flag for their own character. And pretty much what it does is it gives their characters extra abilities, power. Mm -hmm. It brings them up from being unconscious, and it gives them that moment that you see in a lot of like television or movies where this character has been shit. The in Sorry, can I go? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this character has been absolute shite the entire movie, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're about to die, and all of a sudden, like, uh, was it Boromir in, um, in Lord of the Rings? Mm -hmm. Where 
holding his ground, he's getting hit with arrows, and he is on his last, and you know he's gonna die, right? And well, of course, it's that Sean Bean, team. he always dies. He always dies. Why, Sean Bean? Why you do this to me? But it gives that scene so much weight, because you know he's gonna die, and you, st you know that, but you're like, but I don't want him to. He's being so awesome right now, I don't want him to die. I wanted that in my game, right? And so, a player can choose, if they, it looks like the encounter is not going their way, to raise the death flag. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it gives their, depending on, um, and death flags are specific to class. So depending on your class, your death flag will do something different. And it will give you a bunch of extra power. It is supposed to help your party survive the encounter. Now, when you raise the death flag, no matter what, no matter how your party gets through that encounter, your character will always die. That's, that's one of the rules for it. But the you know, design philosophy behind it is it should give you that little extra oomph you need to sort of survive something that's going wrong. Now, for me, that gives consequences, which I like, but it also allows you to fail forward. Mm -hmm. Right? And not only that, because you have to choose to actually activate the death flag, it gives player agency to death, which is a problem that a lot of GMs deal with, right? It sucks when you're, like, finding, fighting, like, uh, you know, random goblin group C, and they get a lucky crit, and now your character's dead, right? That's, it doesn't feel meaningful to the group. But when you raise a death flag and it gives you all this extra badassery to your character, and you had to ch yourself had to choose to do that, now you do feel like a badass, right? It changes the narrative scope of that encounter to put you in control of it, you as the player um, here, in control of it, and gives your death a little bit of meaning, right? It makes you better able to accept the death of your character because they went out cool, right? They went out in a way that is narratively important because you know if you didn't hadn't have done that your entire group would have died right you'd have all had to meet remake characters it gives your sacrifice some meaning so you know from that angle right with failing forward um that is how i address that you know to try to have my cake and eat it too because i want consequences but i also don't want the game to end mm -hmm. now when it comes now when it comes something one little thing that i did notice that, mm -hmm. I f that I found I found very in I found very interesting mm -hmm. when it came to was a rule that you had set up to to allow to allow for some kind to allow f to basically allow for a benefit that can be that can be acquired even when ca even when characters are being the wiffle bat <laughs> when it comes to, when yeah. It comes to yeah, yeah, yeah. the whole miss enough times and event and eventually you'll be able to do that attack Call with that advantage. Focus. yeah yeah mm -hmm. Um, which I th I think fa I think falls into that whole fail forward thing in a mo in mm -hmm. a more direct sense. A lot of the fail forward yeah. that we've talked about up up to this point are more uh, are lean more on the narrative end of things, whereas this mm -hmm. is far more overt. Yeah, far more overt, far more mechanical. Um, yeah. And I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that the reason for that was just to was just to make it so that people don't get compl don't get ridiculous. Don't get too frustrated when they keep when they keep missing. Yeah, so it's not like misses are all that like common, right? You should have a pretty good bonus to things you're good with, right? And you're gonna hit. But what I noticed, um, there was one session um, where I was a player in the like the local games that really kind of made this stand out to me. It's also the same reason why you do half damage with a missed weapon attack. Is we were fighting a, I think it was a giant of some sort. And we started the fight, and these, like, uh, at the local game shop, I think there were, like, three and a half hours that you would play. Yep. And so we started the fight at the beginning, and for some reason, that night, no one could roll, like, above a seven. Right? Six, five, three, two, five, two, we're, like, over and over again. No one could roll above seven. And the fight was so boring. Oh, my goodness. Like, everyone, no one there was having fun, right? Mm. And I understand, like, there are, in order to, if you're trying to, like, you know, be a mathematician, right, and produce the most fun, there are certain points where you need to not have fun in order to have a whole bunch of fun later, right? Mm -hmm. But that, that wasn't one of them, right? That just, that was a slog to get through. And so I wanted to look, I'm like, okay, how can I, because it, it's not just 
that it took so long is that every time someone rolled a miss, they're like, crap. Okay, well, I guess I do nothing. Nothing came of the fact that they missed. And so, for me, this is more of a psychological ploy as a, as a GM. I want the effect when someone misses to be like, okay, well, yeah, I missed, I really wanted to hit there, but, hey, I, I, I got a point towards my combat focus, right? I got a point towards doing something better later, right? So it kind of rewires people's brains for when they miss, they're like, okay, yeah, that sucks, but, right? It gives them a little something, right? A little piece of candy to keep those, you know, uh, those feel-good feelings, you know, moving forward. Uh, that was the point behind that one, right? Is I just, like I said, I want people to have fun with the game, right? I want to put in systems that help people do that and mitigate the points which might not be fun without eliminating them, right? Because it's, you know, in order to have a, you know, really feel fulfilled or feel uh, fulfilled by a game, there has to be moments that kind of like suck, right? There has to be some hardship. But if you can mitigate them in the right ways, they won't be something that makes someone, you know, quit your game, like, you know, rolling below a seven for an entire game. Mm-hmm. Or for, you know, entire three and a half hour session. Yeah. Now mm-hmm. when it comes to when it comes to class design, because yeah. ob- obviously one of the big one of the big things is the um I've called I've called it the zodiac of classes that you ha- that you have, where you have a total of twelve, which is mm-hmm. I, be- I believe significantly larger than the co- than the core um, amount. Um, like, let me check. One, two, three, mm-hmm. four, five, yeah, twelve. Six, seven, That's what I have. Eight, eight. Nope, it's about the same. Never mind. I was mm-hmm. think I was thinking it I was thinking it was somewhat smaller for five E's list, but nope. It's the it's the same dirty dozen. Yeah, it is uh, the same dirty dozen. That is by design. But yeah, continue. But what wh- when it came to when it came to taking the des- the design ethos for core for core five e and putting it into your take, what were s- mm-hmm. were there cer- were there certain archetypes that you felt that were that were a little bit un- a little bit um, underused in core that you wanted to address, or were- or was it largely a um, e- was it largely an even trade with a lot of them, and which ones are going to be the most drastic change? Um, so, all of them are drastically changed. Mm-hmm. I don't think that it used to be not the case. There used to be some that very much resembled what they were in 5th edition. Um, that's not true anymore. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons. Well, no, no, that's, there's, there's none that really resemble. There's some that resemble the 5e versions in word, or like in title, in wording, you know, whatever is legally usable um, from the SRD. But the actual mechanics of them are all very much changed. And for me, what I wanted to address, and this is why they're all kind of changed as they are, is I wanted to make sure that each class did something not just for itself, but for the group, right? Mm. It had a way to interact directly mechanically with the group. And that required me to pretty much change them from the ground up for the most part. So now the fighter is more of a tactician, right? They, com- they have a mechanic called command, which they can say, hey, you, do X. And they have a list of things they can command someone to do. And that person can use their reaction, because they keep reactions from 5th edition. Mm-hmm. I run them in the same way. And that person can use the reaction to, fulf- if they choose to, fulfill the fighter's command. Right? And there's a command to attack, there's a command to move, called reposition, um, and there's a command to rally. Right? So this fighter, now their core mechanic is all about commanding people around them. And for me, what that allows is for the person who's like me, who's a very tactically oriented person, to fulfill that role without really having to say, okay, now you do this, and now you do that, because that's not fun, right? That's just, you're playing the game for everyone. Mm-hmm. But now you have an avenue to do that, that doesn't really step on the agency of all of your other players. So that's fighter. Um, for me, Warlock and Cleric were always the same thing, I mean, I know they're very different mechanically in 5th edition, but you get your power from a patron, so I made them the same thing called the Vessel. Um, the Vessel is a more recent change. It used to just be called the Cleric, but people were like, well, why aren't they a good person? It's like, okay, fine, I, I, will, I will concede and I will call them something different, so you keep a- don't keep asking that. But so they're the Vessel, um, and they are 
they hold that same kind of um, flavorful position as the cleric or warlock, right? They're given their power, they're given their ability from a higher power. Um, for, like, overuse or underuse, I did not like the way the ranger played in 5th edition. They didn't provide anything to the party. Maybe pass without a trace, maybe silence, at, like, at, at least how I saw it used. For what it's right? worth, you're not alone on that. The ranger has been, has been the most has been one of the most scub cla class designs in 5th edition, and they have tried yeah. to address this many times over the last few years. And I think have failed, for the most part. <laughs> but, so what I wanted them to do, like, okay, well, what does a ranger do? A ranger survives, alright? So what should a ranger do for the party? Well, he'll help them survive. Of course he'll help them survive. So, I have a, um, in the game, right, I there's things that look like a short rest, Except there's kind of multiple versions of it. You can push forward, which doesn't take an amount of time. It's just you push forward, and it costs you a resource that you have. And it kind of gives you some abilities. But there's also a version of a rest called resupplying. Right? And resupplying generally either, you know, requires you to go back to town or go back to your cart or your camp or, you know, take some time off. Because time is a resource that should be evaluated by... I mean, at least in an adventuring game, it's a mm -hmm. resource that I've put into the game. And so, but, you know, taking time to do something is going to cost you. With a ranger, they, well, one of their abilities is they are so good at, with manipulating their surrounding environment, they'll give you a free resupply. You don't have to go back, mm -hmm. which is really strong, right? That really helps the group, right? When you can just resupply your potions, your poisons, whatever, um... Because in this system, you know, once you buy a potion or poison, you kind of have that version of it kind of forever. Yeah. Um, so when you're able to replenish those resources for free without needing to, like, take the time element, that's really helpful, right? That helps the group no matter what. They can also, one thing, uh, one of my favorite things that Ranger does, um, at least in one of their archetypes, is they can give other members of their team their unused movement speed. Because positioning, at least in a lot of encounters, is very important. Where you are, how fast you can get there, is important for a lot of encounters, fights, or not fights. Mm -hmm. And a ranger can give their team their unused movements, and they have a lot of it, right? And that becomes really important when, oh man, you know, your dwarven wizard, he doesn't move very fast, but he needs to get up that hill as fast as he can. When you have a ranger in your party, you can feel that on a mechanical level, which like kind of pertains to the narrative level. So my goal in redesigning all of these classes, right, was to give them something that no other class can do, right? That yeah. was kind of open and, you know, promoted working together. Um, like, oh, what's another good one? Wizard, which is a more recent fix. Um, wizard can make spell scrolls, right? That's one of the things they do. Um, and they can give those spell scrolls to their party, meaning they can have their party cast their spells, if they need to, right? They can kind of distribute the spells that they could normally cast themselves to their party, right? So, you know, even if they're unconscious, they still have that wizard spells in their list of things the party can do. Sorcerer, um, their meta magic can affect any magic, not just their own. Enemy's magic, your ally's magic. So if you have a sorcerer and a vessel in your party, when your vessel casts a spell, the sorcerer can augment that spell with meta magic. That creates party cohesion and forces the group to work together in a way that doesn't feel like it still makes everyone feel special right makes everyone feel like a badass mm -hmm. um so that was the goal with each of the classes is to give them an ability that not only made them feel awesome but made their party feel really awesome as well yeah. um and yeah for that you know a lot of the classes had to kind of be redesigned from the ground up mm -hmm. and when it com when it comes to now ob obviously my gimmick is that is that of the is that of the monk <laughs> and I think mm -hmm. I can tell you what sort what sort of characters I pl I play a lot of in mm -hmm. in fantasy games mm -hmm. so I look at the disciple and mm -hmm. especially given its its use of enhanced movement it there's definitely a lot of similar DNA between that and the traditional monk, but mm -hmm. where would that, where would a class like the disciple be familiar, be familiar and different, and where, and where would it do, where would it add this whole contribute to the party kind of thing that you've been building? 
So disciple for me is probably one of the most versatile classes, right? Because most it the disciple is very much a martial class, right? It's physical, it's moving around. But what makes disciple so like fluid? Because I have twelve classes, right? And I have three mental stats. And so four classes in the game revolve around one of the mental stats. So that I have a four 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 ratio, it's like split up evenly. So there are four intuition classes, four wits classes, four resolve classes. Intuition classes, which the uh, disciple is, are all about being fluid, adaptable, being able to look at a situation and have something in their arsenal to be able to kind of handle that situation. Right? Resolve classes are about power, powering through. I'm going to get through that situation in the only way I know how. And which classes are more about preparing and tactics. So, disciple, right? As an intuition class, my goal was to give them a kind of fluid list of ways they can adapt and the way they do this, and kind of a you know, very <sighs> a w- way that I really like is they get extra actions and extra reactions in encounters, which is huge because you can use your action to dash, you can use your action to attack, you can use your action to search or gain more information. So that is their kind of core, right? That's the core thing that makes them really, uh, well, I mean, they've got a couple cores. But that's the one thing I really like that makes them fluid, right? Because you can use one action to, you know, give your ally a potion, the other action to dash, get over to another ally, and then your movement to give another potion to an ally, right? They have that sort of flexibility that you really want in a, for me, what generally people who I see play monks or disciples or anything like that, they really want that ability, right, to adapt to the situation, to kind of flow through different situations in a way that's not too, like complex because the 5e monk has 17 unique abilities that don't work together right they don't i mean they work sorry they work together okay but they don't build off of one another they're kind of 17 unique separate abilities that kind of have a similar how should i say like similar theme right similar eastern theme but they don't a lot of them don't really interact with one another so i wanted to condense that right and make these abilities build off one another Extra actions one way. The other core mechanic they have are their stances. And stances are built towards surviving encounters. Um, and so to kind of emulate that fluidity, right, that ad- adaptability, um, the core mechanic of the stances is that you can't stay in the same stance twice in a row. You have to continuously shift. So each archetype of the disciple, and that's really where the, the, the flavor of the disciple shines is within their archetypes. Um, each archetype of the disciple has a list of stances that it can shift between in order to better adapt to situations. Um, so for me, that's how I kind of fundamentally changed them, and that's how they affect the party, is that they have all these different options for what they can do. For all the classes with that second action, they are the most open and fluid for the items they use. They can attack, they can move, they can double move. Um, all of these things to get them to where they need to be in that encounter to fulfill the role they might need to fulfill. Mm-hmm. Now, now, um, given that you've t- given that you've talked about each cl- each class contributing to the party as a whole in that in that way, um, mm-hmm. there's one class that's o- that's always been that's always been the unfortunate pick for people who. Want to try? Want to try the whole do do things semi do things semi solo, and that mm-hmm. is the rogue. Um, yeah. How how did you ta- how did you tackle that I- that particular issue with your take? No, I I totally agree. Right, the rogue is what people pick when they want to be the loner. Right, they want to. So for me, the one thing that I hated about the fifth edition rogue, right, is that. Why would I play Rogue when I can play Bard? Bard gets almost as many skills, they get spells, which makes them almost infinitely more adaptable to situations, to handle things outside of combat. And yeah, Sneak Attack can do a bunch of damage, but, you know, have you ever polymorphed into an ape and then just hit things? That works pretty well too, right? So there's like, all the situations a Rogue can handle, a Bard can, for me, can handle infinitely better, but they don't deliver you the flavor of the Rogue. That's why people, I think, play Rogues, if they want that flavor. So the way I handled that 
Um, in Heavens and Heresies, there aren't that many skills, um, although that's, that's kind of misleading. Because in 5th edition, your skills are attached to specific ability, or, uh, ability scores, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like Persuasion is Charisma. I don't have Charisma in my game, but in Heavens and Heresies, your skills are just your skills. You add them in where they are relevant, right? So you could make a, if you're trying to intimidate someone, you could make a Strength Persuasion check. Right? Strength and persuasion. Because persuasion is one of the skills. But if maybe you have some sort of uh, information on the person you're trying to convince, maybe you make a wits persuasion check, right? It's all... The skills are just added on to these ability checks to, you know, for whatever makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, and there's only seven skills. But since there are also six attributes, there are, you know, technically... Or technically, what, like 42 different combinations of that, or whatever there is. Mm -hmm. But, so, the rogue, they get proficiency in every single skill in the game. All seven. As their core feature, right? There is not a skill in the game that this rogue is not proficient. Right? If you want to be able to look at a situation and be like, yeah, I can do that. You got a rogue, right? You don't, with a rogue, you don't have to worry about... Crap, do we have someone that can pick this lock? Crap, do we have someone that knows about magic? Crap, do we have someone who, you know, understands the way poisons work on a body? That's a rogue's job. A rogue's job is not to sneak into places. A rogue's job is to know information. Anyone can sneak, Mm -hmm. right? A rogue's job is to implement a plan to get them something that they want. And so that is how I tackle rogue. It's not, they can sneak. They're, you know, really good at it. But they're also really good at everything else. So, for people that play rogues, they and this has just been my experience, the people who play rogues, they want to feel special, right? Really good at everything. And so I gave them that section of the game, right? For skills, if you want to be really amazing at your skills, pick rogue. It's going to reward you with that. And it's not to say the other classes can't do certain skills, but when you have a rogue in the party, they're going to handle all those skills really, really well. Um, the other thing that um, I gave them that I really like is that if you are using initiative, initiative is sort of a you in the heavens and heresies you apply you use the initiative mechanic where it's relevant and you don't use it where it's not relevant. Um, but if you're in a, an encounter that needs that mechanic, rogues rogues can take an action before anyone else, even you know if they're really um, you know be, you know even if you know the enemies. You know, kind of group has rolled a higher initiative than your group. Um, that's another kind of key difference: is you roll initiative as a party rather than as a single person. Um, but the rogues, they get to, to take an action before, so they get to kind of, in that way, develop the way they want that encounter to go before anyone else gets a chance to. So that's kind of how I uh, tackled the rogue. Sorry, that's a little rambly. Yeah, no, no worries. And it's one, it's one of those things that I'm well, I'm well aware would be. A tr- a tricky thing to to ta- to um, tackle. Um, one thing one thing that I did one thing that I did notice with some of the casting classes is that while there is while there's definitely the whole spell charges thing that's not that's not the beginning and end of it, which um does which does lead me to some something regarding um magic. Mm-hmm. One rule in particular that's been kind of that's been kind of our whipping boy when it comes to the magic si- when it comes to the magic system mm-hmm. in fi- in 5th edition is concentration and this is especially yes. the case for the wizard which is why the wizard is probably the least popular um casting class in 5e but for me the strongest but continue is the is the fact that so many spells require concentration, which is go, mm-hmm. which, is, which is a very large action tax, and mm-hmm. pretty much makes haste almost mandatory, so that they can do other things besides just concentrate on that spell. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what's your t- what's your take on how you ap- on how you approach casting and and the concept of concentration? So at first, when I started like playing with an- or fifth edition, I really liked concentration in theory. When I first started playing, I liked it in theory because, like, okay, for me, I want each class to be balanced, 
right? And that's not been the case in most um, kind of D&D games. Casters have more ability to affect the narrative than marshals do. That's just been a fact, especially high-level casters. They can change the world in fundamental ways that marshals cannot. And I never liked that. I thought that was dumb. And it's like, okay, if this is supposed to be an equal option, right? Why don't why don't they actually have equal options? So I thought at first concentration was great, right? Because it gives a way to kind of limit casters, you know, and maybe make marshals comparable. Problem is, it doesn't. It, casters are still just better, <laughs> like almost in every way. They the their ability to affect the narrative is still way more than you know your typical martial class. <sighs> so concentration just felt like attacks against you doing cool stuff. So at first, when I was writing this um, and using the same sort of spell system, the fifth edition, I don't use that spell system any longer. I kept concentration. Um, with my current spell system. I, it's not necessary for the game, right? There's no spell that you would need to concentrate on. But that's part of the part of the reason for that is the way I've split up what I call spells and what I call rituals or artistries. Mm -hmm. um, so for spells, they are your general kind of instant change thing to other thing, right? If you want to charm someone, confuse someone, do a ball of fire, do a ball of ice, right? There's these kind of base spells which you can add features into, like make it go a farther range, make it turn into a ball to cast fire ball, make it turn into a cone to cast, you know, a cone of fire, right? You can, that's how the, it's a more kind of fluid spell system in that way to deal with all of the different, like, fire spells that you had in 5th edition, right? It's just... Yeah. You have the fire spell, you can add secondary options to make it into whatever shape you want. Mm -hmm. uh, same with, like, cold and all that. Now, what I did for this game, and this is how I balanced a lot of the classes and the ancestry pairings with one another, is you have a separate thing called rituals, or um, rites. Um, titles are all kind of work in progress. But rituals are things that you don't get if you have access to spells. You have to spend you know, some of your proficiency points, which you get a character creation, to get them, just like you would a skill. And if you pick them, um, depending on which type you pick, you can now perform these rituals or spells, um, and they have certain lasting effects. And most of them are on some sort of internal timer, so they'll only act last for this long, or do this thing and then be done, or can be cured by X, Y, or Z, or have some other sort of thing that limits them. But... Anyone can get it. A fighter can pick up, you know, a ritual and or pick up, you know, a ritual proficiency in, you know, malediction, right? To cast curses on people. And if they have the materials, right, and they have the, you know, other things they need to cast that ritual, they can curse someone, right? It's not bound by class anymore, right? And for that reason, it doesn't require concentration, right? It has another cost. And that cost is currency or materials in the game which are determined by the encounters you face. Mm -hmm. So, originally, you know, for me, uh, concentration was, oh, this is a really cool thing. But as my game developed into not just a 5e homebrew and into you know, its own like actual game, it's like, well, the things concentration solved aren't really relevant anymore. I don't really need them. So, um, I, I've kind of done without it um, at this point. And the and the dignity of spellcasters everywhere just rose three points in the process. <laughs> yeah. Um. But the the um the big re the bi this is kind this is kind of why I want this is kind of why I had to bring up the wizard because the the big reason what the big reason why the wizard ends up being less popular is because of the fact that it doesn't have the the side grade ver variants of casting the way other casting classes have like say the like say the warlock mm -hmm. um you ha you um instead instead they just get they just are falling back on the whole you get more spells than everybody else but the problem mm -hmm. is um with core because of the fact that so many spells have the have that concentration thing um, yep. They don't get it. They don't get as much of a chance to utilize the whole, the more spells that they get because they're casting them 
pretty much at the same rate as everybody else, but they don't have anything to compensate. No, I agree with you there, though for me, the power of a wizard is not in combat. The power of the wizard is their ability to affect the narrative outside of combat and change the way the game is fundamentally played through those outside of combat spells. But no, I agree. Like in com and the other problem with the wizard is like it's so much bookwork. You gotta like pay for your spells, you gotta put them down, you get to a level, like it's it's awful. Like who wants to do all that bookwork? Like there's no reason to. But yeah, sorry, continue. <laughs> now, one one particular um cl one particular class that I've, that I've that has had has had its issues. In fact, about a week ago, I ta I tackled a playtest project that was doing its own approach with it. Is mm -hmm. the dr is the druid because yeah. the dr druids and clerics have been infamous for being whole parties unto themselves they're kind of they're, yeah they're kind of oh, similar yeah, to the to the problem with the problem with the rogue it's mm -hmm. but in the opposite direction people want to do the loner thing with the rogue whereas with clerics and druids people end up being able to do an entire party unto themselves simply yeah. because of what simply because of that class's kit yo oh, yeah 100 percent. i agree with you there um how how is this how is this sort of thing addressed with your equivalents in Heavens and Heresies? So for me, there were always kind of two people who played druids. There were the people who were really playing druids to, I don't know, because of what they could do, right? Oh, I can cast this spell at this level, I can get this speed at this level, I can really do X, Y, or Z to really maximize my potential in the group. And those people, I think, are like far in the minority, right? Not Most people who play druids don't really do that. They're not playing it, oh, I can, you know, change form at this level to get into this beast, and I can take half damage if I, you know dip a little bit into Barbarian. People who actually do that, even though we make a big stink of it online, they're, they're very few and far between. Now, for me, people who play Druids, most of the time, they are people like, you know, I want to play a character who's very nature-oriented, and they're a little bit weird, but they're not too weird, like in a Warlock. You know, they're nice, comfortable middle grounds, and they can heal, but they like that's not their thing. They don't have to be a healer, right? They don't have to do X, Y, or Z. And so I wanted to really, and so for me, like, the player who wants to play a druid, they want the thematic elements of being, I don't know, nature-oriented. Mm -hmm. And they also want, you know, a kind of wider range of abilities or features that kind of let them go in the direction they want to go to. Because in most iterations, druids are very open mm -hmm. in what they can do. They can cast, you know, um, a lot of damaging spells, they can cast a lot of support spells, they can cast a lot of control spells, they're kind of all over the place a lot of time. So I wanted to give people that option. It's one of the reasons why my druids are an intuition based class, because they can be very open. And so the way they do that in the game is a mechanic that is called the Aspect, and it works pretty much exactly like uh, Warlock Invocations. Mm -hmm. Right? It is a list of abilities that you get to choose for yourself. That give you that allow you to take your druid in the direction that you want to take them, in. and all of them are thematically linked, mm -hmm. um, or nature and you know that element, and they give you ways to help the party and you know kind of exist as the druid you want to be as, right? You don't have to be the shape changer, but you can be if you choose that archetype, or you could be a druid of the land, which I fixed because druid of the land is really dumb in five E, but don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so for me, my druid of land is more like a geomancer. They get different bonuses depending on which type of land they're standing, right? Which makes them very flexible because mm -hmm. if you're standing in water, right, you want abilities that are going to affect water, right? So it makes sure that no matter what, you're going to be relevant to the situation because you have abilities that are going to help you in that situation because you get abilities depending on where you're standing. Um, and so, and then the um, 
the beast, the can the beast druid form for my version of the game, they're more lycanthropic, right? They're more about changing like half wolf, half this. They get aspects from different animals, which fulfills that needs, and then their like aspects can fill in the gaps. But for me, right, because I can't design a class unless it helps the party in some way. What really makes druids cool is they can share their life force with people. And you now I can say that, and people will be like, ooh, that sounds really cool. But mechanically, what that does is, um, for heavens and I'm going to sum it up. Imagine if hit dice were way more important than 5e makes them out to be. Mm -hmm. um, I take that mechanic, and I make it a core concept to most classes. Um, it's not called hit dice, it's called vitality. And it is... It's your build, it's your staying power, right? It's your ability to encounter multiple things and keep going, right? Druids can share their vitality, which they don't need a lot of, with other classes. Mm -hmm. They can, just by existing, make other classes have more staying power. And that's huge to the party, right? That's amazing, because a lot of um, classes' abilities require you to spend vitality to even use their abilities. So if you have a druid in your party, right, he is gonna feel like god supreme, in that like, hey man, you need some more vitality to be, like, extra badass? Yeah, I'll give you some of that, right? It really fulfills that niche of, like, helping people on that more, like, down-to-earth, like, nature level mm -hmm. um, with just their core ability. And I... Oh, I, I you know, the way I design mechanics is mechanics should always support the narrative, but also what you know, the player wants to do, right? How they feel feel or feel fulfilled, right? So that's why um, earlier I said that my classes are more like playstyles, right? Because people who pick the fighter, they generally want something specific to fight. They want shine and martial combat, and for the most part, people who pick fire, they also want to like control combat. Right? They want to be the star in combat. When you pick fighter, you'll want to fight. Right? And so my fighter, not only are you going to be the star in combat, but you're going to make other people be amazing in combat. That's what you're going to do. Right? So it's going to fulfill that role for you. And the truth is the same way. You want to be connected to nature and helping people and fulfilling all these different roles. Boom. Druid's going to do exactly that for you and help your party do it as well. So that's how I kind of tackle Druid. All right, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, sorry for the ramble again. <laughs> <laughs> like I, like I said, like I, like I said before, this um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm no, I'm no stranger to 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 rambling. Um, <laughs> now, when it come now, I did notice that you you are doing the you are doing the with a fair few of the classes you are doing the whole subclass thing that yeah. fi that five E had. Um, Mm -hmm. And given one, given at least one of the ones you mentioned, um, I'm cur I'm curious if I'm curious if um sub if the format for subclasses remains largely the same as it is in Five E, or if you're or if you're going to be tweaking the formula. So that was another thing I really liked about Five E in theory, right? There, there are things I like in theory, and then in practice in Five E, it's like, well, I don't actually really like that. So in theory. I liked the subclasses because they said, hey, player, if you want to do X, here's subclass Y that will help you do that. Mm -hmm. So for me, I like that. I'm like, I'm always on board with being 100% on board with being, hey, if you want to do this, here are the means to do that. We're not going to hide it from you. So for me, subclasses are an opportunity to do that. And the other, because the other design goal I have for this game is I want you were talking about it earlier, right? Where even people who are super into narrative, they're like, okay, well, we need a tank and we need a healer. You know, I want to get rid of that shit, right? I want a team of four fighters to have a really fun game together and be able to have an amazing experience as four fighters or as four, you know, rangers or as four rogues. I want each kind of class you know, to have, be able to have that experience with another class. So the subclasses really allow me to do that. And I'm still of the mind that, okay, yeah, even if people choose the same subclass, I still want them to have a good game together. Mm. But the subclasses, for me, their main 
kind of uh, design goal is just to add differentiation into the class, mm -hmm. right? There are to allow options, but there are to allow options that are pointed and focused in a way that you would want to move if you want a specific thing for the class. So my goal when designing them is like, all right, people who like druids, here are the like list of things that they like about druids. Because for me, I don't actually really like druids, but I'm designing a game for other people. So here are the things that people who like druids really like about druids. Let's make sure that these things are represented in the archetypes that I present to them as options. And so the archetypes for me are a way to connect to other players and make sure that the things people find cool in games are represented in the game I'm presenting to them. Mm -hmm. Now, one, thi one thing that I remember having a bit of contention about regarding... Um, Regarding fi regarding five e regarding five e and two two things actually and I'm cu I'm curious if this is another case of liking in theory. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them is hit dice, which mm -hmm. I felt I felt was a case of I felt was a case of missing the point, and the other mm -hmm. was um was feats. Yeah. In both cases, in both cases, I feel like it. I feel like it. They were. It was a case of missing the original intent of that particular mm -hmm. thing. Now, yes, yeah. feats in third edition got way out of hand. <laughs> I, won't, I don't I know what you're talking about, and I wish you would quit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally get you. Yeah, and when it come when it came to the whole, oh, it's an optional version of the ability score improvement. I felt like that was missing the point because the sole reason feats were introduced was a means of personalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and with hit and with hit dice, that it it always came off to me that hit dice were meant to be the answer to um to the old healing surges, except. Mm -hmm. The reason healing surges exist was to take the pressure off of the cleric so they didn't have to be the heal bot. Exactly, exactly. And having having the having hit dice be re be relegated to essentially RNG in that yeah. in that sense instead instead of a, instead of a static amount instead of a static amount that you can use during downtime or in combat. Mm -hmm. Um Again, ca again, kind of misses the point. I think it's, I think it's again, people took it, took the whole healing surge as, as if to say, as if to um, say that you're doing Wolverine style healing because, mm -hmm. because the narrative was they were turning D and D into a video game, even though I think mm -hmm. that narrative is rubbish. Yeah. But okay, I'm what... so excited that you brought these two things up. Um, mm -hmm. Continue. But what is? Are, are these things are these things largely unchanged with heavens and heresies, or are these things are these things addressed? And if so, how? Uh, no, a hundred percent addressed in very explicit ways. Let's start with uh, hit dice, right? Because mm -hmm. again, something that I love in theory, mm -hmm. right? But not in ex like because no build no f abilities in Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition really use hit dice. Like they're just kind of there. You could take them out. And, like, they wouldn't interact with any other things. So, and again, yeah, like you said, RNG Jesus, please RNG Jesus, give me the healing I need. Oh, he didn't? Well, there goes that. So, one thing in Heavens and Heresies that is just there, and this is more per personal preference, and I get that it might not be everyone's, but healing isn't random. If you ever get healing, you're never going to roll for it. Damage is random. Right, you'll get random damage numbers, but healing fixed. You can always rely on healing because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to rely on healing. I don't need that amount of swing into my encounters. I have enough swing in my encounters. There's crits. There's this. There's that. There's all these various damage swings. Healing can be constant, and that's the same for vitality, which is how I have reformatted the hit dice mechanic. Um. It's constant. It's based on a number, and it gives you an exact amount each time you use a point of vitality to heal yourself. Um, but it's also used to activate other abilities. You regenerate amounts of it. Your maximum reduces as you try to push forward, right? It's this core mechanic of the game. It's not just this afterthought that's been added, mm -hmm. which I felt like it was in 5th edition, right? It is 
like you cannot exist in heavens and heresies without addressing vitality. It's just how you have staying power throughout a number of encounters throughout the game. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, that has been to say addressed would be mean it's a problem. And I get that some people like the way that hit dice work in 5e, and that's totally fine. Like, I'm not trying to like bag on the way that they have fun, that's totally fine. I run it differently because of the things I've experienced that have made it non fun, for me, right? Um, and some of the things you mentioned random, random, like it's not random, no healing is random in this. I want people to be able to rely on healing. Mm -hmm. Um, so. For me, it's a core part of the mechanic. Like, there are various classes that use vitality as a resource, right? And that's what I was saying about Druid, is they can give vitality to the classes that need it most, like, give them more ability to be what they are, which is awesome. Now, for the... What was the other one? Um, the other one was feats. Feats, yes. So, for me... And this... Um, Meant earlier, I was mentioning that I want every class to be able to fulfill every role. And for me, I kind of view roles as different. Uh, or view roles a little bit differently than most. I don't think there's any such thing as a tank, but that's a discussion for another time. But for me, the roles are the spike, the control, and the support. The spike is killing things. It's removing things from an encounter. The control is making sure that things in the encounter act in a specific way. Um, for me, that's where a tank is. A tank is a type of control. That's why I don't use a tank, but... And then a support makes sure that the other two can do what they need to do. They make sure that the control is able to control, and they make sure that the spike is able to spike. So those are my three kind of you know, delineations of um, roles. And what I wanted to make sure was that each class, to a certain extent, was able to fulfill any role. And I do this in three sort of ways. So what makes you, you, make, makes your character, your character, is a combination of three things. It's a combination of your ancestry, right? Your ancestry is going to give you certain abilities that are going to determine the way you play. Um, that's why a dwarven wizard is just as good as an elven wizard, which is just as good as a human wizard, but they all play very differently, right? And your class, of course, like you... Your class is definitely going to determine your play style, how you play. But the other portion of that is feats, right? I hated in 5th edition that you chose ability score or feat. Because in most of the games that I ran as a GM, everyone would choose ability score. Mm. And I don't fault them for it, no. right? They're like, this is the best choice that I have to me. But for me, as a, G or as a DM, it's like, this makes your character so boring. I want to see the feats. The feats are some of the feats are really cool and really applicable to this situation. I want to see them, right? That would make the game so much more fun for me. So what I did um, from a design standpoint is I separated them. You get ability score increases at certain levels, and you get feats at other levels. And your feats are really where you get to make sure that you are fulfilling the role. Um, R-O-L-E, uh, mm -hmm. rather than R-O-L-L, -L, uh, that you want to fulfill, right? Mm -hmm. If you want... design that for this game, right? The feats will let you do that, right? They're really the player's options, right? Because in a lot of the games there's that um, option paralysis, right? Mm -hmm. And I've tried to or was it, um, I can't remember, but it's like, you have, there's too many choices. Choice paralysis. Yes. And so you choose your class and you choose your race, and there's a, like a limited number for those, so there's not too much paralysis there. But your feats is feats are really where it opens up. But the way that they're structured is like, hey, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? Mm -hmm. If you want to be this, here's the feat that will make you the best at that, right? It's not hidden. It's very, like, overt, right? Hey, you want to be the best person with a sword who's really good at attacking people with a sword? Hey, pick this feat. It's called Sword Master. It's going to make you the best, or Blade Master. It's going to make you the best person with a sword of any of the other feats. No other feat is going to make you better with a sword. And that's not true for 5e, right? There are certain feats that will make you 
better at something than other feats, right? Like um, Sentinel or Polearm Mastery, right? These feats that have a, I'm talking about for Marshall's side, I, that's where I generally tend to think more of the fun is had, but, you know, these feats will have a lot more impact than a lot of the other martial feats that exist. And for me, I, w I wanted to make a game that's like, no, 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 no. Hey, you want to be the best at using axes? You pick axe mastery. I'm not trying to hide from you. I'm not trying to sugarcoat things. This is what you do. Hey, you want to be, like, an amazing just, you stand in the front lines, you do what you do, and you wear heavy armor? You pick heavy armor mastery. That's what you do, right? And so for all the feats, that's what I tried to approach them with, right? Is this design philosophy is they tell you exactly what they're going to make you the best at. Mm -hmm. And once ag once again, I can I can understand why why fe why feats were so were meant were so are so limited in Five E because it's very much a response to the o to the Overwatch feat design from Third, but um, a hundred percent, yeah. The pendulum can swing too can swing too far the other direction, especially since in that case your a full adventuring career is only going to have four opportunities to personalize, and mm -hmm. that's just not yeah. that's, that's just not an, that's just not enough, especially especially with some more esoteric kind of builds that somebody might want to do. Yeah, especially for us. are balanced and all that but yeah no i totally agree oh no did i lose again no there you are sorry yep but with all with all that said what do, what does the future hold for um for the development of heavens and heresies because i know i realize that the game that the game is still in uh, is still in active development at the time of this recording <laughs> yeah um. so so real talk i'm a grad student right mm -hmm. grad student at brown university i'm working on my dissertation right now this game is a passion project, but I'm a researcher. That's what I do for a job. And so when I approach something like this, I approach it from a kind of, I don't know, a logic of how can I research this? How can I put in the work to make it done or to make it you know, what I want it to be? Right. My dissertation is going to be about 300 pages long. Right. And so when people say, oh, you can't design something that is that long as, or, you know, for games, it's like, okay, well, that's what I kind of do as a job. And so I approach this with that same, you know, amount of respect, but also kind of understanding of the, the work it will take. And how about there, right? Like, with all the stuff that I've written right now, it's about 300 pages. And I've been playtesting it over the last couple of years, you know, designed it. And so for the next steps, right, it's about, like, me and my own schedule I need to implement the things that I've learned from playtests, and I've done that to an extent, and then I need to playtest those things that I've newly implemented. And so for kind of a release, and you know, being this is a me passion project, something that I'm working on, I am working on, okay, here are the things I want to implement, let's put them in the docs so that, you know, everyone can see them, and they're not just in this, like, disembodied, like, handwritten notes that I have hundreds and hundreds of pages of. Uh, let's put it in in the docs so that people can understand them and then let's play test them mm -hmm. so um i have a you know kind of plan in the next six months i'm going to play test the kind of the biggest changes from these most recent play tests um because i've in the system i've ran a year and a half campaign that was high, super successful um i had four players in that campaign mm -hmm. um all of them very happy with how the campaign turned out. Of course, there were changes in the mechanics of the game as the campaign played out. And I've also run a series of one-shots for um, a bunch of other groups that were successful. I mean, some of them more successful than others, but all of them successful in the fact that I learned stuff, right? So, in the next six months, I'm planning to kind of incorporate the you know, stuff that I've learned. Right? Get the next phase of the game, the .05 or whatever version of the game this is, um, and, you know, for me, it's about promoting, right? I'm putting in the work, I'm doing the things, I'm reading outside sources, I'm doing all the kind of things that are necessary to understand the way the games are made. I'm not just some, you know, lacking, like, I think it'd be fun to make a game. Mm -hmm. But, uh, 
you know, it's about promoting, it's about getting the name out. So, and then after that, after I get this next implementation, uh, my goal is to have the kind of mechanics, even if I'm unhappy with, you know, some parts of them, settled by November of this year. Mm -hmm. Mechanics settled. After that, I work on polishing, which I totally understand. I need to hire an editor, which I'll do, um, to go through and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. And getting the kind of art online, which is slightly moving in that direction. I have more and more art by the day. Um, and I've been teaching myself InDesign, which has been a process because I've never learned InDesign. But, you know, over the last, um, you know, four months or so, I've been slowly teaching it to myself. And really, this is a game that I'm putting together myself. Mm -hmm. I don't expect a lot of people to buy it. I hope that they do. I really do. But I'm putting it together myself. I'm going to order a hard copy version of myself. If I get enough followers, I'll put it on Kickstarter. If not, um, I'll put the PDF on some sort of drive things. But this is really something that I am funding, mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, from my own pocket. And I'm fine with that. I understand what it is. Um, to support it, though, you know, I'm at the moment making merchandise. I've got hoodies and shirts at heavensandheresies.com mm -hmm. to kind of, like, support that. And, you know, they're cool, and I like them, and, you know, people kind of get what they pay for with that. They get something really neat, um, they support the game, and, you know, that kind of helps me, you know, fund the various, you know, artists and editors and all that that I, you know, kind of hire um, from my own stance to uh, kind of deal with the game. But that's kind of my rambly uh, trajectory of the game. Um, my goal is within the next year or so, I will have it... You know, put together because you know by November I'll have it kind of fixed. Um, I'll have about six to eight months to actually put everything I have in the dock into InDesign with the art, um, and then I'll have a rough PDF that I can send to an editor to put together and to kind of deal with. And yeah, so <sighs> a long process, like a longer because you know I'm a grad student funding this out of a grad student's pocket, but you know I understand the realities of that. And with the with that in mind, I'll I'll certainly be looking forward to how how it develops. And yeah. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity here. No, I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed it. I love talking about stuff like this. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often yeah, say around here, it. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, I uh, have finished my drink, so uh, <laughs> encouragement welcome. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>